you're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast, hosted by Zach Bechtold and Matt Franks. We hope you enjoyed today's podcast, and check us out online at beardedtheologians.com. You're listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast, hosted by Matt Franks and Zach Bechtold. And uh, we, have a, we have a special guest with us today, a uh, man by the name of Ken Willard. Uh, he's joining us um, from afar. It, uh, I had the opportunity to meet and uh, work with Ken in, in several different places in New Mexico, uh, coming in, sharing his gifts and graces. And uh, what I find very interesting fun, unapolog- unapologetically teaching pastors how to do their job. Um, I don't know if he would describe himself that way, but that's how I do it, because I think it's great. Uh, so, Ken, we're glad to have you on, man. Um, would, you, would you tell us a little bit about yourself? What sure, you sure. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I am a, a certified coach uh, through the International Coach Federation, and all of my clients uh, are pastors. I coach pastors around the country, and uh, I'm also... Uh, doing some uh, church consulting over the past almost 10 years. Uh, and I think that's where we cross paths somewhere. And uh, so I, uh, I'm a certified church consultant. Uh, there's actually an organization called Society for Church Consulting and, and uh, received my certification through them. Uh, and I'm an author with Abington Press. Uh, I have a book that came out a couple of years ago called Time Management for the Christian leader. Oh, there it is. There it is, right there. <laughs> Thank you for the plug. Yes. That's right. <laughs> uh, although it looks unread, so um, I'll encourage you to read I, that. I haven't, fig- I haven't figured out the time management part. <laughs> <laughs> I never, never seem to have time to read that. That's, the <laughs> That's right. <laughs> number one thing I hear. Uh, and I have a book coming out uh, shortly. Uh, in fact, probably in about two weeks uh, called Stride. Creating a Discipleship Pathway for Your Church. Right. In, in uh, one, of the, one of the places I got to connect with you, I think was over, uh, before this book came out, I think you were in the process of doing it, uh, was the Moventum uh, uh, class or workshop that you did. Uh, yeah. I did read that. Uh, I, sat, <laughs> I sat in the room with you. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, a couple things. Um, kind of... We'll, we'll go with the new book. Uh, we'll start there because uh, clearly time management is not in my, my wheelhouse. Uh, <laughs> uh, but tell us a little bit about um, these discipleship pathways, kind of what, um, what that looks like and what it means for uh, not only pastors, but for uh, the greater body of the church itself. Sure, sure. So, you know, one of the things, uh, having the, the privilege of working with a lot of different churches uh, of all types all over the country, you start to see trends. And when I first got into church consulting, a lot of what I was reading and hearing from other church consultants and just various voices uh, was really leading me to believe that it was all about mission and vision. And if churches would just embrace the mission and have a vision for their ministry, everything would be fine. And it really took me Uh, a year or two before I came to the the realization, you know, mission and vision is wonderful and we certainly need those, uh, but it's really all about discipleship. And everything that I kept running into in churches, uh, if you trace it back far enough, it's, you know, it's a symptom of us not really focusing on discipleship like we should. And, and that really changed things for me. And, and um, the workbook you held up, I mean, that came from a lot of uh, working with churches, doing different trainings, and it sort of evolved into that. And then that's, uh, that has actually changed uh, into the book, Stride, actually came from, you know, one of the earlier uh, parts of Stride was Movementum. Uh, and that came from a, uh, a quote that's often attributed to John Wesley. Uh, Wesley says, you know, one of the best ways to keep a Methodist alive is to keep them moving. And we sort of, you know, changed that and adapted it. Uh, so I, I have been very blessed 
in my own uh, journey to, to be at a church where we've really focused on discipleship from the beginning and created a pathway and actually created several different types of pathways uh, to help people take a step as a disciple. And, you know, again, part of the journey for me has been uh, discovering that most churches just don't have anything in place, uh, a process or a system or whatever you want to call it, a pathway uh, for discipleship. Uh, now, every church I've, I've ever encountered has lots of great things going on. And, and I don't think any church is at zero. And I think that's a big piece of the hope. <laughs> you know, every church already has just wonderful things going on. And a lot of times it's a matter of connecting the dots. How do we help people see that all of the different ministries and programs and all of it that's going on uh, really is leading towards discipleship. Uh, so that's, you know, it's a long answer, but, uh, but that's really, you know, kind of what's happened with uh, discipleship over the years. Well, Ken, would you say that part of the problem um, in our churches is, is that we've created silos and the, the problem with silos is that they kind of, stick people in places and there's no necessarily room for growth or they get so sucked into one ministry that they find themselves, I've been doing this for 27 years and then they find themselves, I'm not growing anymore. Um, would, would a discipleship process and, and, and I'm asking this because I'm not really familiar necessarily with discipleship processes. I've just been in churches that this is who we are. This is what we do. And, 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 right. and, and I'm slowly doing some studying. That's actually why I was really excited about picking up your book because we're in the process of trying to create a discipleship process here in my current appointment. Um, but would you say that um, with these, these silos that we've built up um, in, in most of our churches, that there's no true connection uh, throughout the whole church? And would a discipleship model, an actual discipleship model, allow people to see a broader picture of the church or was, is or are we just creating something, another layer to add to the many layers that we already have? No, that's a great question. I, I, I like to think of it in terms of uh, spiritual disciplines. So if you think about the ministries, the, you know, and, and it can be silos. Uh, I, I think oftentimes, though, what's happening is people are connecting into an area, and it is feeding a discipline or two. For example, they may be, they may be in a Sunday school class and they're, you know, they're, you know, their fellowship is growing. Uh, they may be, you know, having some type of accountability. They may be doing some great things there, but they're missing out on other spiritual disciplines. And it may be serving. It may be, you know, you know, fill in the blank. There's, there's whatever list you want to use. Uh, I think, when, when a spiritual uh, discipleship pathway is done correctly, it helps people see that it's, it's really all of the spiritual disciplines together, working together, that helps us take a step closer to Christ. Um, they're all good. You, know, you, need, you need all the disciplines. So someone serving in a ministry, someone who's doing a lot of serving, I think often can get burned out because they're focusing so much on one discipline and missing out on the rest. And the rest of the disciplines, Sabbath, worship, I mean, just, you know, all of them together uh, will help us grow as a disciple. And I think that helps alleviate some maybe not all, but some of the burnout that we often feel. Yeah. How have you found, Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead Zach. No, I, um, I was just going to ask you to, to kind of unpack that a little bit more that, it, you know, in, in traveling around and in teaching and, in and exploring and experiencing this burnout, you know, in, in churches all, all across the world and, and country and, and wherever you've been, how have you seen, um, effective ways to begin to move people out of that burnout um, and into another piece of, another area of discipleship, another area of growth. Right, right. Well, you know, there's like so many things, um, I don't think there's one answer. 
I think everybody is different. Uh, I think that a lot of times it's just situational, it's seasonal, things like that. Uh, that said, uh, I know you guys have experienced the same thing I've experienced. People who are serving in areas where they're gifted are much less likely to, to experience burnout. Because in many cases, it doesn't even feel like serving. You know, I, I am gifted in this area. I'm using God's gifts, and I love it. And I think part of our challenge is, uh, you know, I talk about one of the appendix in the book is called inviting versus recruiting. And often in churches, what we're doing is we're trying to fill slots. And we see, you know, when we look at, you know, whatever you want to call it, ministry openings or, you know, serving opportunities or whatever, we have, you know, we're focusing on those openings. And we're trying to, you know, to recruit, we're trying to, you know, whatever, to get people to fill those openings. And that puts the focus in the wrong place, I believe. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that I think can easily lead to burnout. Uh, when we're, you know, I've, I've heard people begging. I've heard people threatening. <laughs> you know, we don't get people to serve in this area. You know, we're going to shut it down or, or whatever. And I just think we're focusing in the wrong place. When we focus on uh, the disciple. How has God gifted you? Where is your interest? Where is your passion? Uh, Eric Reese wrote, wrote a great book uh, years ago called Shape. And I use that all the time. I mean, how has God shaped you? And let's find a place to apply how God has shaped you in ministry. You know, that's calling. That's, you know, that's helping people discover their calling. And you know, I, I just believe 99 out of 100 times, they're going to enjoy it so much, they'll never burn out. And that's why I think we run into those exceptions where maybe it's happened even by accident. You've got somebody who's been serving 38 years in, you know, fill in the blank, whatever ministry, and they love it. And it's never been work. And and I just think, you know, I, I you know, hallelujah, somebody got lucky, <laughs> you know, Oh, how can we have that happen a few more intentional times? Uh, so again, long answer. Hope that's helpful. No, it, it makes perfectly good sense. Um, one of the things that our staff has done um, here, um, we've been focusing on strength-based uh, leadership stuff and been looking at that and asking the question, how are you utilizing your strengths in your ministry? And what's been kind of a great thing for our staff is like some people are realizing what their strengths are and saying, you mean I can actually use this in my job? <laughs> and like, yeah, we really, we'd love for you to use this in your job. And it's been amazing to see the last couple of weeks, how people have kind of taken that on and in the heart um, and applying that in. And I think you're right that the more we can utilize people's strengths and, and get people to realize, you know, that, you know, we, we don't, and I think maybe this is the problem with the the Methodist church and their, and their system is that we have holes to fill by discipline standards <laughs> and that, um, so many times, um, maybe the dis maybe our discipline standards aren't really contextual for what we need. Um, and, and there, I know there's some give and take in that, um, we can structure in a way that we need to. And, and I'd be intrigued to see how many churches would be willing to restructure to fit the ministry that they need to do. And, and, and right. some of the times it's just, we're so stuck. This is, you know, and, I know Zach's dealt with this serving in churches and I've dealt with this over the years in serving churches. Well, this is always how we've done it, even though it's never been effective. <laughs> um, <laughs> my God, we're going to, we're going to creep. And, and I think of it turning on a car, you know, um, I don't know if you've ever owned a car where you had to turn it on in a special way. You know, you got to hold certain yes. things, do certain things. That's kind of how I feel when we're trying to fill holes. It's like, we've got to hold um, these things together so we can start the car just to even get the car going instead of actually right. rebuilding it and building a better system get the car started in a, in a more efficient way. And, and to me, that's what I think when I hear discipleship processes is that that's what we're trying to do. Um, we're trying to get people started and, and geared up and, and to know what a, a process is for people. Some people need a process. Some people need, you know, just to be led by the Holy spirit. And, and, and I think, um, 
we kind of need a, a realization of the two. Um, and so I'm like, right. I'm real appreciative of, of someone like you who's uh, interested in, in this stuff and sharing this gift. Cause I think it's important for churches to have at least something. Um, and even sometimes it's just realizing, recognizing what that something is. And I think far too often right. we, we forget about that and we just, um, you know, Hey, this is who we are. <laughs> and we have no clue what we're right. doing. <laughs> well, and, and I think that's why, you know, Bishop Snazy talks about intentional faith development. And I, uh, I, I just think that's so important. How can we, how can we partner with the Holy Spirit? You know, I can't do discipleship for you. However, I can partner with the Holy Spirit and I can provide resources, encouragement, and accountability. I mean, there's lots of things I can do to help you grow as a disciple. You know, yes, you own, you know, you own that. That's the intentional part of it. But, but not alone. And I think that's part of the role of the church is how do we come alongside you know, those in our congregations uh, and provide those that resources, the help, uh, you know, the intentionality part of it. Uh, a lot of times it's just communication. A lot of times it's just helping people see. Uh, I don't think we've done a very good job for various reasons of, uh, of helping people understand that's what the church does. We make disciples. You know, all the other wonderful things we do, uh, whether it's, you know, social, whether it's uh, justice, you know, whatever it might be, should be fruit from making disciples. You know, that's what disciples do. Uh, so I think all the great things the United Methodist Church and every church does should come from the place of making disciples. You know, we, we've, we've coined a, a phrase uh, on this podcast. Uh, we say a lot that we've put discipleship in the corner. Um, and, and it's for that reason. We've taken the intentionality out of it. We, we crank out the next uh, book, the next study, the next anything. We put it in people's hands, but we don't actually teach them how to use it. We don't let them know they're not walking alone. Uh, you know, Holy Spirit's with them. We're with them. You know, we don't walk them through. Uh, we don't journey with them. And, and so we, we, when we talk about it, we talk about, you know, we've put discipleship in the corner and it's staying there. Uh, but we've got to pull it out of the corner and be intentional about it. Um, and, and you're right. You said it early on. We've got to connect the dots. Uh, we've got to put these pieces together. And the pathway may be different from person to person or will be different from person to person. Um, but allowing them that intentionality to say, you know, I'm starting here. My next stop's here. And we right. walk with them through that. And this person that starts in the same place goes this way to this dot. We go with them there as well. Right. Um, you're right. That intentionality is huge. And I think it's something that we've, we forgot uh, just because we have to put the next big thing on uh, just to show that we're doing something. Right. Um, well, and, and, you know, we've done over the years, the Methodist church and every church, you know, we've done lots of great ministries and programs and, I, I think part of our challenge is uh, how we've communicated some of those. And I think unintentionally we've sent a message to many people that, you know, if you take this class and, and we've even called the class discipleship and, you know, discipleship 101 and, and, and we've sent this message that, okay, I have finished the class, so I'm done. And, and I don't think any pastor, I don't think any church leader ever stood up and said, you know, you're done. But I think we've unintentionally kind of sent that message that, you know, there's, there are people who have taken things, and they're all great classes. They're great resources. It's not the, uh, it's not the material. It's not the program. I, I think it's, you know, the way we've communicated it, uh, that we've, you know, we've, we've not helped people see that as long as we're on this side of heaven, we're not done. None of us are through. We've all got steps ahead of us. Uh, but my step is different than your step. And, and that's where it gets messy. Uh, I think often in churches, we, you know, we want to paint this big, broad, you know, stroke. And we want to, you know, we want to do one thing that's going to grow everybody. 
and there's just no one thing out there. <laughs> you know, I don't. I think if it was out there, we would have found it by now. Yeah. Uh, I think everybody's step is different, uh, but I do think we can we can help everybody take a step. Right, and I think that that's important. I mean, I was I was talking with a um, um, someone just recently about this, and then we were talking about You know, he was like, "I really wish we had a discipleship pathway," and I said, "Well, what would that look like for you? Um, you know, what help me help you?" and um, as I started thinking about it and what he was wanting and what I think or, or you know, or like we were on these two different wavelengths. And so I was just trying to say, so what we're trying to do then, what at least this person was wanting was, is just a process of growth. And, and we think of it um, and, and we can, you know, there are many ways that we can handle that. And, and you've lifted that up is that there, there are so many different great resources out there to help us grow. And, and, and sometimes, um, you know, it's more of those, you know, just, having churches and you've, you've also said this is just actualization of this is who we are. This is what we do and, and getting people plugged into that. And, and sometimes maybe it's just cleaning up that process a little bit and saying, you know, um, here's where we're, here's where we're lacking in this. How can we, you know, what do we need to do to make to strengthen this portion to help these other two? Um, and I also right. think too, it goes to realize that everything is connected um, within the life of the church. And, and it goes back to my silo comment. I think in most of the churches I've served, it's, you know, you've got all these little ministries that surround the church, but none of them, you know, it's hard to get someone to connect into those ministries or connect through those ministries. And, and, and maybe within a process, it would help tear down those and bring, instead of having all these little silos, you have just this one community of faith, which is really, at least in my opinion, what the church needs to be. Um, so that way it can provide opportunities for growth. And it's not just, oh, that's so-and-so Sunday school class. You know, they do this, but they don't want anybody, even though that like what they're doing would be great. And there's people that you could plug in there, but, you know, and, and creating an attitude of, of growth, um, spiritual growth. And I think far too often we get so focused on that um, growing numbers versus actual spiritual yeah. growth. Um, yeah. we, we look at churches and we see, oh, wow, you know, they jump 35% in worship this year, you know, and, but, you know, it's hard to measure discipleship. <laughs> um, right. Uh, right. Because, well, yeah. and, and that's, and that's one of, that's exactly one of the big struggles. I think a lot of churches have, um, uh, you know, one of the things, and I know Zach heard this in, uh, the seminar that I do, you know, one of the things I share with churches is it's not our job to build the church. That's never been our job. You know, Jesus said he would build the church. And I, I think one of the things we have to do is we have to release that. Uh, you know, if Jesus is going to have your church be, you know, 50 people or 5,000, you got to be okay with that. Uh, our job is very clearly to make disciples. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, you know, there's a, there's a caution I always give churches. Be careful because I, I can almost guarantee when you really start making disciples, Jesus will send you more people. Uh, you know, your church will probably grow. Uh, but I think you're right. I mean, I think we've, we've got to be careful, you know. Uh, and there are ways to, to see fruit from discipleship. Uh, and I think it's, it's a very common struggle, you know, what you shared. Many churches, uh, they get kind of hung up on, well, how do we know if people are growing as a disciple. And I don't think there's a, a proof, but I think there's lots of things that would indicate uh, to me someone was growing as a disciple. If somebody's coming to church, if, some, if somebody's attending your church once a month and we help them intentionally grow as a disciple and next year they're coming twice a month, you know what? That may not be proof, but I'd feel pretty good that they're taking us down. You know, you know I, I would say, you know, brother, sister, you're heading in the right direction. Uh, and that's just one. I mean, there's lots of things. I think, you know, we have to be careful because I don't think there is absolute proof, but there's lots of really good indicators. Well, and I think one of the big indicators, and I think we've moved away so far away from this, and, and I actually find it very frustrating is narrative um, and having people share their story and share. Right. Um, I don't know. I, I, my big frustration is that we don't allow time for testimony. 
um, in worship or in, you know, Hey, we're going to have this little get together and people are going to share about their faith story and, and where they feel convicted. And, um, and even I, I, I've had two people that have had these awesome faith experiences in the last six months that I want the congregation to hear. And so I'm like, Hey, why don't you come to my office one day and we're going to video you. We're going to have a conversation and I want, I want you to share. Your, and I said, right. And, and, and I think we've moved so far away from the narrative that we just focus on those numbers and what's crazy to me, and this is something that I've really wrestled with, um, is that our biblical basis is narrative. Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. And, 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 and I think the, that kind of bring us back to center to kind of help us is that numbers are important. They're good indicators of, you know, if you go from 50 to five in worship, there's a problem there. <laughs> you know, yeah. you got to fix that. <laughs> but, right, right. Um, but if you go from, you know, 50 to 51, and the 50 people are increasing in worship by, you know, yeah. their worship attendance from going once a month to twice a month. Why? You know, what's moving them? What's driving them? And, and people need to hear that so that way they can make more disciples. It's sharing the story over and over again. And I'm shocked at how far we've moved away from sharing the narrative of how God is at work. Um, we do a great right. job in pulpits. You know, pastors do a really good job of sharing other people's stories. Right. But, it, and, and I was thinking about this when I was attending a, a church just recently, man, I would love to hear why people come here. You know, tell yeah. me why people, you know, and don't put it on a flyer. Like I want to, right. you know, see in a YouTube video or, you know, Hey, click on our, you know, click on our face stories. Here are our face stories and click on this link and you can watch all these YouTube videos. Like I would, you know, that would be a church I would love to be a part of because then I'm going to be curious, how did they do this? And, and, yeah. um, and I think that that's just kind of, to me, as I was thinking, as you've been sharing, like, man, I, you know, we need to do this more. <laughs> um, right. And I'm really excited about your book coming out. Yeah. I mean, we, we live in a time where that technology is available to every size church. I mean, that's just such a wonderful thing. Uh, the, the smallest church, you know, farthest away from everybody else. I mean, you know, you can hold up a cell phone today and video somebody for two minutes and show it Sunday. Uh, so I, I agree a hundred percent. I think it's just such a, a, a powerful piece of sharing, you know, whatever it might be and, and sharing why you're here, sharing, you know, the, the testimony of serving, the testimony of giving, uh, just anything like that. And, and cross generational. I think that is so powerful to be able to see, people of all ages sharing those short stories. That's, that's what's going to change lives. It is. And, 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 and I think Matt's right. And Ken, I think you're right. We, we've gotten away from narrative. Um, and then when we do have narrative, narrative, we, we tend to qualify it. Um, right. well, your stories, you know, when, when I was working with campus ministry, we did a, we did a junior high camp and the, the college students brought, um, you know, brought the sermons, told their stories, uh, whatever throughout the week uh, to the to the junior high students. And every semester when we put this on, or every year when we put it on, I'd have three or four kids. You know, I want to talk, but my stories, you know, it's kind of boring. Right. I don't know. Your story's not boring. <laughs> you know, and I, and I heard it from college kids. I've heard it from youth. I've heard it from people that are 90 or 100 years old. And I was like, there's no way you made it to 100 and your story's boring. Right. You know, somebody's just, they're, they're literally out there dying. Right. Waiting to hear your story because right. they're, they're, they're in the same place. They're feeling the way you felt and are, are literally dying waiting yeah. to hear your story of how God's impacted your life. And, and so we, we fall into that rut of, Oh, it's gotta be this big dramatic thing. No, all, all stories are important. All of our narratives are, are, so so valuable and uh and that's huge in that discipleship piece of, of sharing yeah. those so that you know from from the youngest to the oldest to the you know if they want to qualify it as boring to the most dramatic um those stories are important and help us connect those yeah, pieces. That, that's that that competition that mm -hmm. comparison you know i mean that i don't think that's god's voice Mm -mm. Uh, and, and I think, you know, as you guys know, I mean, that's, you know, that's one of the struggles with pastors, with churches, uh, no matter what's going on great here, uh, we're looking at that other church. What are, you know, what are they doing? How come they're growing? What's, you know, and you know, the best thing to happen in any city is for a church to grow. 
and it it because I believe it ha- it helps every church. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the, the church down the street is not the competition. Uh, but I think it's just human nature. Unfortunately, we're we're kind of you know we hear somebody's testimony, and we immediately think, well, that's I can't compete with that. I can't you know my story is not as good as as their story. Uh, and I think you're absolutely right. They're all great stories. <laughs> you know, they're different. They're different. So, so Ken, with all that you've done, you know, you, you have um, the the great book on time management, and then you have this book on on creating discipleship pathways um, coming out. Um, what's one thing you would like to offer to our you know few listeners? And I'm hoping I'm hoping the annual con- <laughs> my annual conference will pick this up and actually like utilize our, our conversation. But what would be one thing you would suggest to those that are listening right now? Um, to pay attention to or to, you know, just a kind of a nugget of wisdom? Well, I don't know if it's wisdom, but I I will share, uh, you know, one of the things that I've really come to believe is that every single church can and should have a discipleship pathway, Uh, whatever you call it, pathway, process, whatever. But there's got to be some intentional uh, you know, process to make disciples. And I think every single church of every type, every size can have one. Uh, I think most churches are much farther along than they believe they are. Uh, I've never come across any church that's at zero, and I don't think there is a church at zero. Everybody's got, you know, some great things to build on. Uh, I will share that it, it usually takes time. When I work with a church, to help them create a discipleship pathway. Uh, it usually, we're usually looking at 12 to 18 months uh, because it's not the pathway that's important. Um, you know, the pathway should be, you know, a, a visual representation at best of the actual discipleship. Uh, so, you know, it does take some intentionality. It does take some time. And I guess the one, the one last thing I would share is, uh, you know, the realization that I've discovered recently, the big thing that I've discovered in the last few years uh, is the power of discipleship coaching. Uh, I think that, you know, again, kind of we've, you know, as a church, we've, we've tried to do things uh, for everybody. And we've tried to hit these big, broad groups. And I think there's, there's something to be said for that. That's good. But at the end of the day, discipleship is a one-on-one process. And somewhere in the equation, there's got to be a one-on-one conversation uh, for, for one person to be able to speak to another person and talk to them about their specific uh, discipleship growth. How can, you know, where are you now? And let's talk about what that next step might be. Uh, So, you know, the Navigators have written several great books on it. They've been doing this for a lot of years. Uh, There's other places out there. You know, I didn't come up with this. (laughs) Uh, I didn't discover discipleship coaching, but I I have done, uh, I don't know, hundreds of these conversations. Uh, And I've even done them in in, uh, airport bars with total strangers. Uh, and talked about taking a step. And so it can be done. Again, any church can do it. Uh, but I think that discipleship coaching is where, uh, is where it really hits the, uh, hits the road. Well, Ken, we want to, we want to thank you for your wisdom and thanks for being on with us today. Um, and, and hopefully this can be a resource that goes out, uh, you know, to three or four listeners that we have, but, uh, <laughs> help them begin to uh, either either strengthen their discipleship pathway or or know that they're not at zero, uh, that they've already taken some baby steps and just to capitalize on that. Um, yeah. So again, thanks. Uh, you've got an open invitation to come on with us anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank I appreciate you. it. Sure. Blessings on uh, you and your ministry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for all of those uh, of you listening at home, if you'll check out beardedtheologians.com, we have some great blogs. We have uh, check out our, our past podcast. We've had some great guests on. Um, you can download us on iTunes and Google Play. Um, buy a shirt, buy a mug that helps us do this a little bit 
better in a little bit longer. Uh, for the Bearded Theologians, I'm Zach Bechtol. And I'm Matt Franks. Thanks for checking us out. Thank you for listening to the Bearded Theologians podcast. We hope you've enjoyed listening and we hope that you share our content online uh, through Facebook and social media. And we hope that you check out our uh, Beardcast store at beardedtheologians.com and pick up some great Bearded Theologians gear. We hope you have a good day.